Well, Dr. Chris Stout, uh, a good friend, of course, uh, a renowned psychologist, a good friend, and, and also I would say a mentor in the angel investing space, someone who's done a lot, uh, someone who's been on the podcast. And, and I genuinely um, reserve like a, a 2.0 podcast for, for my good friends who <laughs> wow. I want to carry the conversation. So thank you again for doing this. Awesome. Thanks, George. Good to be in that uh, league. Of course. It's my pleasure. Um, well, I, I felt it was especially you know, important to have you back on because when we first did the podcast, we were just trying to figure out when that day was, uh, we, which we presume to be before the pandemic. A lot has happened since. A lot has happened in your life. Um, you know, you're, you've moved from Chicago to Wisconsin. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but did you officially retire? Well, not officially. <laughs> so, <laughs> In, informally. Yeah, yeah, informally retired. So, um, yeah, I uh, just... I, just to, we can circle back to this, but uh, in terms of official capacities of needing to be somewhere and working for someone else 40 hours a week, I am not doing that anymore. Yes, exactly. But you're still keeping busy, of course, doing a lot of yeah. uh, interviews. You, you have your own podcast. So uh, I do admire that. I, I wanted to ask and start, I guess, the conversation just first of all, seeing how, how you're doing. How has oh. it been these past two years? Thanks, thank you, and and I want to hear about you too. Um, good. It's it's been a lot of change and a little bit of time. I mean, you know, as as you and I both have lots of experiences that seem to you know happen and fill up our days. But um, just conversationally, long story. We um, I left ATI in uh, tail end of twenty nineteen. Um, we were looking to, my daughter graduated early, which was neat, a semester early, and she and I were looking to doing, catching up on some traveling, kind of the first part of 2020, which COVID totally derailed. So that was kind of disappointing. We still have, have plans to try and catch up on that. She's just recently to almost, well, I guess, I guess actually Monday was her first day of work at a, at a new company. So, uh, we've got to figure out how she can do vacation, but anyway, we, um, my wife and I kind of did a little bit of a back of the napkin to look at where things were. Um, we had two homes at the time, one in the Chicago area and a second home that we'd had up in Wisconsin for a while, and kind of figured that we could probably do it. Our Both of our kids were, we were empty nesters. We were kind of in the proverbial stereotype of downsizing. Um, uh, there was no reason for me, you know, for us to be in a big house in, in Chicago anymore. So um, we kind of didn't know what it was going to be like to try and sell a house in the early parts of COVID. Um, it was weird and different, a lot of virtual stuff, but it went fine and quickly. Uh, and then now, you know, since then, it's like the price is like we could probably sell our house for, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars more if it was for sale today, but uh, happy to have it be done and, and no, uh, no seller's remorse. But um, we came up here and it's... It's a different kind of lifestyle in the sense of it's a beautiful area. I'm, I can look out right here and see Green Bay. We're on a peninsula. Um, and just have really kind of gotten back in touch with uh, nature and the outdoors. There's a number of uh, parks. and I mean, you can kind of do anything you'd like. So I've you know been able to get back into longer distance running and running more frequently and workouts and things like that. So it's it's been great. The pandemic, even with gyms closing and YMCA's closing and things, really didn't affect me too much because most of the stuff I like to do is outdoors anyway. So that was that was good physically. And then I just really kind of doubled down into uh, my nonprofit. Um, I had started it in 2007 and always, you know, I've written about it a lot and we've talked about pivots and things like that. But um, I just really needed to, like, we refresh the website. We started a fellowship program, a certificate program. Um, we, you know, just really built it out in a lot of ways. A lot of the podcast guests that I've had on um, have had a, a humanitarian or global health kind of perspective. We launched a LinkedIn newsletter um, called Tools for Change, which is a free newsletter for anyone on LinkedIn. And it's Gosh, we've got over 125,000 subscribers to that, which has been great. Uh, the podcast has wow. been growing. It's just, you know, it's it's all been, it's nice. It's not all, you know, jammed into one day. I mean, you know what it's like to, to balance multiple priorities and things. But, um, and, and still doing startups. Um, I've been involved in a variety of those, just consulted with a fellow now. I'm kind of 
part of it's it's kind of an interesting evolution. We can go into a deeper dive if you'd like. But we, um, you know, I, I do the startup stuff, and that's that's traditional kinds of things. It's it's sometimes it's it's um, there's a, a salary that goes along with it. Sometimes it's equity, et cetera. And now I've kind of shifted into doing mentoring. My alma mater asked me a week ago today. I did a uh, a webinar on uh, to the School of Science students on uh, graduate school or getting your first job. So that was a very and we've been, I've been talking with some of the people there behind the scenes in the department about doing mentoring and having Q and A's and things like that. And I just had another fellow who's a former um, Olympic athlete reach out to me, and he's trying to get some things going. And it's just, it's kind of like this nice Venn diagram of overlapping activities where I can kind of bring things, you know, to these folks. And he just sent me a contract this morning that he got from someone and it was like, ugh, you know, it was not a good contract. So it's sort of like with him, I'm not doing it for equity. I'm just being, you know, kind of a mentor. So I'm sort of tippy toeing into being um, more of a mentor to folks looking, you know, with, he's kind of a unique situation. You know, he's, he's an adult married guy with kid, a, a child and, and uh, an Olympic athlete, former Olympic athlete trying to do some things in media and television. But, um, you know, the others is, you know, it's kind of more of what I'm used to of graduate students and people looking towards graduate school. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's a variety of different kinds of applications of those skills and different kinds of ways. And if I can be of help to someone, you always try and try and do that. So yes, a lot going on. Uh, obviously, as, as we were talking, um, you mentioned that that you you do a lot of like long distance running, especially now you know in Wisconsin there, there are a lot of parks near you. Have you always realized and made the connection of how exercise has a positive impact on your mental health? Ah, uh, gosh, yeah, you know, and it's it's interesting. A lot of the stuff that I read and and write about and use for research and podcasts that I you know consume and enjoy myself, um, you know, really, really are focusing. I don't know if it's it's just you know because of what I'm I sample and this is what I tend to read a lot, but just the the positive impact on uh, mental health and longevity. Both. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Peter Atia's show, The Drive, and. Yes. And Rich Roll and, you know, those those kinds of folks. And they, you know, there are a lot of the guests that they have that are just, you know, amazingly uh, competent scientists and physicians and researchers and whatnot, you know, all kind of, you know, lean into those kinds of, of uh, you know, good habits. You know, it's, it, and it's, sort of, it's sort of funny in some way, like the, uh, the aspect of just, you know, being healthy is relatively simple, you know, if you don't have any kind of, you know, pre-existing conditions or complications, uh, but, you know, just to, to eat healthy to sleep well, uh, and to get exercise, you know, all of those things just really conspire together to have a better, you know, health span and and quality of life, as well as probably longevity for most folks. And I think certainly like you, you and I've talked before about productivity and being able to, you know, manage the stresses that come along with just daily life, let alone the the extra stresses that can come along with startups and, and being a founder. Yeah, no, you're, you're and by the way, I love all the, the podcasters that you just mentioned, actually. Um, and it's funny how I think more people were and became more attuned with with their sort of health uh, in, in all of its aspects, right? Mm-hmm. I think pre pandemic, a lot of it was was, you know, concentrated on the aesthetics aspect of it, right. or just kind of gymming. But uh, and, and even I'm, I'm at fault of this, you know, I looked at a lot of the content that I was consuming pre pandemic and post and post pandemic, shifted heavily on things like mental health, you know, listening to folks like Peter Atia talk about fasting as an example. Yeah. Um, and it was so much more about the specifics of, of, you know, just learning about whether it's nutrition or exercise. Um, why do you think that was? Like, why does it take a pandemic to learn <laughs> about something that should be so essential to our everyday life? Great question. I think part of it might be that um, folks that, went to the gym, couldn't go to the gym anymore. And, you know, which would, you know, kind of freak people out. I mean, most of the time I worked out at home anyway, but I think it also opened up and people then became more aware and more people did more research. And so there's probably a, a bias to, you know, people focusing on these things in, in anything that's consumable, news media or social media or, or podcasts, et cetera, that, um, you know, going for walks. I mean, if, if we all recall back, you know, two-ish years ago when the pandemic was hitting in Europe, you know, people were quarantined indoors. 
wars. And I think that still may be happening, you know, some places in China and whatnot. So people, you know, took, like the only way you could go out is if you had a dog to go walk your dog. So then all of a sudden people started, you know, getting dogs so they could go outside and didn't appreciate the fact that they could, could be out and do that. So sort of like the, the great plan B to being in a gym, which you couldn't go to anymore, was to go outside. And once that started, you know, that happened way before gym started reopening. So I think people, you know, got back in touch with, you know, being outside and being in whatever kind of weather that was. Um, you know, the, the Japanese have long talked about, uh, I think it's called nature baths or nature bathing, where you go out, mm. you know, into the woods, into the forest and just kind of, you know, enjoy yourself out there, not necessarily for a trail run or a, a vigorous hike or a climb, but just, you know, to enjoy nature and pay attention to things. And, when we first moved, you know, up to Door County, I, we we had had a place. We'd been coming up here since, good lord, the '80s, but um, we'd had a place for like ten years. And just when we'd come up, it'd be like hardcore vacation with the kids, and you know, doing the stereotypic kinds of things. But when it was us up here as empty nesters and with more time. You know, you could just, you know, I went for some walks with some naturalists and learned about, you know, more about plants and, and learned more about different kinds of trees and learned more about swales and got a whole new vocabulary that I'm still working on to to be a part of that. And I think all that goes back to your other point about, you know, mental health, that those are all beneficial kinds of things of of mindfulness and you know you can't really go on a trail with a screen you know in front of you looking you know at your at your uh, feeds or your tw you know twitter feed or anything like that so those kinds of things you know and, and the, you know the pendulum also swung swung the other way too people got hardcore into you know into their screens and you know they it was like entertainment and streaming you know people that became cliches and mm -hmm. jokes about you know, just every television show that had 10 episodes, you would just watch all at once because you kind of could. So so I think those kinds of things just cause us to, um, you know, take a minute to, to, to pause, to take a breath and to have a radical kind of change that everybody simultaneously forced into doing. I think people have these kinds of epiphanies periodically pre-COVID <clears throat> because of a health crisis or a health scare. Or because mm -hmm. of some some something else that happened in their life, a New Year's resolution that they just you know want to lose those <clears throat> ten pounds finally or or what have you. But this time, I think it was just sort of this, uh, hopefully very rare, atypical kind of uh, once in a lifetime experience where we all went through a very similar kind of of uh, trauma that uh, you know we we adapted and, and hopefully most people adapted. I, I alcohol consumption also went up for a lot of folks. So uh, hopefully people became yeah. more adapted to it in a positive way that can be, you know, benefits. But, you know, you're, you're a business guy, and, you know, we, we read the same things about Peloton. You know, Peloton's kind of, you know, falling off a cliff. Everybody wanted to work out at home since they couldn't go to their spin class at the gym, and now, you know, Peloton's right the second is kind of in trouble, and, you know, because people are not wanting to be at home anymore and working out by themselves. They want to go back to the gyms. They want to get back on the roads. They want to, you know, do that. So I think we'll, you know, we'll kind of see what our sea legs are, are like. People uh, weren't used to working from home, and, and that was weird at first. Now people don't want to go back to the office. Some people do. I just read an article in the Wall Street Journal this week about, you know, people, some people are looking forward to going back to the office or going to the office in the first place. So, so uh, sorry for the long answer to such a simple question, but uh, you know I think it, you know we 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 sometimes need these little wake up calls that then causes us all as a as a community to to see how we can adapt better. No, I love that answer, um, Chris. Just one, one more thing. Let, let's turn off our, our videos if that's cool. Oh, okay. Um, as much as I hiccups, I, I I much prefer yeah. Sure. Um, I, I just want to make sure the audio is is crystal clear, but. Um, no, I mean, definitely, definitely a helpful answer. Actually, I loved every avenue you went to answer that. Um, what stands out to me, though, is is what you were saying about all right. Like, and I think that's probably the biggest differentiator is when the pandemic happened. To your point, hopefully, an atyp atypical event. But the difference here is that we were all in the same sort of circumstance. Yeah. And sometimes it's tough, right? Because you pointed out, you know, usually this happens through an epiphany. Someone gets super sick unfortunately, or like a New Year's resolution. But it's difficult to do this, especially when you're in the business world, when everyone around you is like this alpha, go, go, go <laughs> right. men mentality. Yeah. And I think it took a pandemic where now we're way more open about, hey, you know what, boss, I'm not really feeling well today or team, you know, I'm, I'm kind of feeling a little down, the weather is getting to me, I'm going to take the day off. Yeah. Three, four years ago, if you said that, I mean, yeah. maybe it wouldn't be verbalized, but you know, you'd, you'd get 
weird looks. I know, I know. I used to have this, I, I'm embarrassed to say now, but I used to have this little little clipping that I had from a magazine that I had posted on a bulletin board in my office that said, <clears throat> basically, eat, sleep, work, just sort of repeated, <laughs> you know, over and over again. And there's the cliches of, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. And, you know, the, the you know, it's just sort of like this chest pounding, you know, thing that, you know, oh, the more I work and the less I sleep or the less I rest or the worse uh, work-life balance that I have, you know, the the better I am. And, it, it, I think it's one thing, you know, like if if you're an employee, I think there's a lot of pushback on that now. But you know, like you said, you know, there's sort of like cultures of certain places. You know, if you worked at at um, you know certain investment banks and things like that, the idea was that you just you know you rocked all the time, and you know as people have called, you know, you became a, ca- a master of the universe, and you, and you you know you suffered for it. Your relationships suffered, your health suffered. You know, substance uses tended to go up, and exercise and healthy eating. Eating tended to go down, and you know it becomes all these bad kinds of circumstances for work. I think it's it's more of a challenge even for founders, though, because depending upon where someone is in their trajectory of getting their company up and going, um, you know, sometimes there isn't anybody else to do that, you know, and it's it is working seven days a week, and and you do kind of do it with the you know making a, a sacrifice and a variety of different kinds of things, but not the sacrifice that you say this is my lifestyle. This is a transient temporary thing until this other kind of thing happens whatever we we IPO or we get enough you know uh, VC backing to be able to hire somebody to offload some of these things so I'm not the chief everything officer so I think it's a little little tricky to manage that and just gets amplified you know if you've got uh, family or people that you're taking care of how how would you recommend uh, for someone listening on, on I think what, what we're trying to get to as well as setting boundaries and you hear that come up a lot, right? Whether it's setting boundaries with a person or setting boundaries with your calendar, regardless of whether you're a founder, of course, and sometimes harder than than others to do. Mm-hmm. But what are some of the things you've learned in your career and, and personal life about learning to set more proper boundaries for a better balance? I tell you, that's, that's tricky. Um, <clears throat> A lot of times you have to be, you know, out of balance or, or unbalanced. Um, right. When you're first starting off, as I've been talking, I, I, I know we talked off mic about some of the mentoring things that I'm doing. And mm-hmm. a lot of times <clears throat> when you're when you're young, it could be young in years or young in the start of a company, a new startup, that um, you kind of have to say yes to everything. It's, it's you know, because you don't want to miss an opportunity. You don't want to, you want to be able to take advantage to every little thing. Not every little thing may turn out, but you still sort of have this, this, this impulse or this probably legitimate need to pursue those kinds of things. Um, I, you know, it starts to evolve over time, or at least it has for me and, and, and others that I've heard, you know, share similar experiences that, like Derek Sivers, you know, says either it's a, a hell yes or it's a no. So you actually start to say, you know, no to things. And I, I've had to do some, you know, say some difficult no's, um, you know, because it, it wasn't a good brand fit for me, you know. Um, and then I just try and figure out if somebody's asked for something that if it's if it's someone, you know, that I have at least a decent relation. If it's a good friend, I'll do it and, you know, just because of the friendship and because we're close and, and that's what friends do for friends. If it's, you know, something that's a little not even quite collegial, but maybe there's some kind of little professional overlap with somebody, um, you know, as I'm sure you've experienced, people sometimes, you know, will kind of try and take advantage of that. And you kind of have to watch Mm -hmm. out and say, well, you know, I want to be of help. So this doesn't, you know, you don't say this to the person, this doesn't feel comfortable, this doesn't feel like a, you know, a proper fit. But maybe I could do this instead. And that can still help you out. I'll feel comfortable, more comfortable with it. That'll get you, you know, what you need. So I, I think it's a, it's sometimes it's really a tight, you know, high wire tightrope, you know, kind of kind of act to be able to say, you know, and, and to, to communicate this with whoever you're close with, it could be your partner, like business partner, it could be, be your relationship partner, you know, your children, you know, your parents, whoever it is in, in your circumstance to say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm getting ready, you know, people are all used to it, I'm getting ready to go into finals, I'm doing my dissertation, I'm doing whatever, it's going to, you know, be heads down and, and working really hard on this. And I'll, you know, see you once I'm done with it. So and people understand that. But 
if people just feel like this is going to, is this going to be what our relationship is going to be like for, you know, for the rest of our marriage? Is this going to be what, you know, whatever relationship is going to be like? And it's like, you know, if it, if it is, then that's where there needs to be some intervention perhaps and some, some, um, conversations around that. If it's a time limited thing, tell, tell whoever needs to know it, you know, when the expiration date of this being down in the bunker is, and then, you know, they can cut you the slack. You don't feel guilty. And then you pro, you know, when you make that date, so, you know, that uh, solid date of when I'm going to be done with this or that, or we're going to get funding or we're going to go public or whatever it is that, uh, that you stick to it. And that, uh, you know, that people can then trust that what you say is going to be real and things can start to get back to a semblance of norm normalcy for you. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's really, really solid advice. One of the things that, um, you know, that you're talking about too, is it, obviously it's very situational. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of, one of the things that I've been doing, um, you know, I, I follow like Jordan Peterson's content um, quite a bit. I don't know if you're, you're yeah. fond of him or, uh, uh, or yep. what your opinions are. Yep, know of him. He's quite the, quite the controversial guy. I, yes. I, I understand most of what he says, <laughs> I think. <so. laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, I'm sure you know, people have varying opinions. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, one of the things that I came across is this sort of like self-assessment um, mm -hmm. sort of test. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think just... The, the positive from that is is uh, taking some time to learn about oneself you know it's funny how like we know so much about other people and i think very few of us including myself know uh, about our, our own selves and how mm -hmm. we think and how we also um you know if a, if, if a situation arises how, why we react a certain way and where that comes from um and i think that's something that i'm i'm realizing is more important now yeah did you ever do any of those self-assessments? Well, you know, yeah, in a in a, a couple of different kinds of ways, um, and and relevant maybe to audience experience. You know, I I, I went to graduate school, so so my most of my traditional education uh, has been in psychology of some some stripe. But right. um, so you kind of have to. I mean, you. You know, you, you learn how to do some of these assessments, you know, with your classmates. You know, you take the test and they take the test and then you score it and write the interpretations and stuff like that. Now, granted, that's with graduate students who you're the first person they've ever done it with. So you put a, you know, little um, skepticism perhaps with all of their interpretations and whatnot. But um, I, I think maybe, an, an, and the other part I should say too, is that um, I'd done some IO kinds of consulting, uh, industrial organizational site consulting, and we had done assessments, you know, there's 360 assessments, and there's a variety of things that really aren't psychological, they're a little bit more um, behavioral or, or business oriented kinds of things, and, and those I think can be very eye opening for people, because it, part of the, the issue is people just don't people are busy, you know, people don't have oftentimes a external reason to do an internal focus, except when, you know, the boss says so, or when they're, you know, something hits the fan. So, um, you know, so I think those can be very helpful tools. I will tell you in my experience, except for maybe the 360s where you get, you know, anonymous, you know, feedback from your, you know, employees up and down, you know, the your superiors and, and the people that work under you or what have you. But um, those can lead to some surprises. But most of the other ones that are kind of non-clinical personality inventories tend to not surprise people, um, you know, as long as they're honest in answering them. And people are always kind of disappointed going, well, I did all these, I answered a million questions and, you know, everything sounded like me. And it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> because you you do have some self-awareness, you know, it's not like totally like, oh, you, you know, you actually love something you thought you hated or anything. And, you know, there aren't those kinds of experiences for most people. But I'll tell you another way to do it. Um, and I don't know if it's necessarily quicker or better or, or where it falls compared to an assessment is, uh, you know, getting involved in, in therapy. A lot of the, the groups that we did, we went, you know, part of, the, part of the issue in some people's training is to go through like group therapy or to go through an individual, you know, therapeutic experience. And oftentimes, even like if, if you go because there's a problem you want to work on, that's one kind of thing. If you go because it's part of an educational experience and self-exploration, that's another kind of thing. There's a variety of different kinds of ways to, to get involved with this and to, to skin that cat, so to speak. So those can be very, um, I, I have a bias, maybe a little more helpful because you're interacting with someone else, either a group of people, if it's a group situation or a, a thing, which is also, you know, always led 
hopefully by a therapist, a certified qualified therapist. But, you know, talking to someone about it where they can actually engage you. It's, think about it like in, in graduate school or in, in school, like with a, the Socratic method kind of a class versus a, an engineering class or a calculus class, you know, where there's no debate. You know, there's a right answer, yes or no. The bridge stays up or the bridge falls down versus something that's maybe a little bit more psychological or philosophical um, to talk about things and, and get into to, uh, deeper issues. So if people have desires to do that, you know, I, I think, you know, assessments and, and online things are perfectly fine. Um, just don't be super disappointed if they don't, you know, provide you with some big, you know, aha kind of experience. But if people really kind of want to dig deep, there's a variety of different, you know, ways to do that, you know, through, through um, you know, more psychological, in my bias, more psychologically based. I'm sure there's other ways to do that as well, too. You know, there's retreats and meditation retreats, all sorts of other ways to do that. But I think it's always helpful to have a mentor, have a coach, have a, a structured way to do it, have a therapist, different, you know, someone to kind of guide you and challenge you as opposed to just always you know um done done solo or or self-help yeah no it's it's very very true and uh, in fact uh, it's funny i i um i sort of had a situation arise where i wanted um you know the opinion of my fiance who as you know is studying in the uh, chicago uh, uh -huh. school of psychology mm -hmm. and and so you know it was funny i was you know saying how do i how do i address this you know how do i, I of course my my impatient self of, of business is like how do I just skip the ad and, and get to the answer? And right. Like, well, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's really not that simple, right? You need someone. Well, I'm like, well, ask me the questions and let's figure it out. <laughs> She's like, George, you know, sometimes it's okay to, to to get therapy for certain things, and I think you know, and I'm as you know, I'm I'm, I'm Middle Eastern by background, and um, to this day, and I see it, and we both see it with our parents, with our family members, this n sort of negative connotation towards therapy. Yeah. There's this visceral reaction that one gets that maybe I'm unwell. Whereas really the thinking is, and obviously I'm sure you're a proponent of this, is looking at therapy just like you would going to the gym. Mm -hmm. It's something that you don't necessarily need, you know, a, a life altering pain point to solve. It could be as simple as just working on oneself to better oneself. Why do you think there there is this weird visceral reaction in society when it comes to therapy? Gosh, that's a great question. I think maybe to, uh, I'm going to give you a long answer, but to circle back to something we we're talking about before, like vis-a-vis -vis COVID and lifestyle changes, I think one of the, if you will, a silver lining behind the cloud of COVID was that I think people became much more aware and open to mental health and therefore that helps reduce and mitigate the stigma around it. I was on a number of, thank goodness, calls and webinars around that. Um, I did one with a group um, like of international lawyers. So it was really kind of interesting that this was specific to lawyers, but it was also generalized to, to the world. I mean, we had a, one of the attorneys was an attorney for Airbus and another attorney was a expat African-American working in Japan, you know, so he had a variety of different kinds of, you know, fascinating kinds of perspective. But the overall point was that people are paying more attention to this and that this is like a, a real thing. Um, in, I think it was in Chicago, if not all of Illinois, that I think now there's some kind of um, uh, permission, so to speak, for kids in school to have a mental health day. I mean, we joked about having taking mental health days when things got really stressful or whatever. You know, you don't have a fever, you're not, you know, throwing up or sick, but, you know, sometimes you just need to take a breather. You know, it's not to, to play hooky or to go, you know, do something different, but just to, you know, to, to recover and to, to heal and to you know, do a little self-care. So to your point, I think part of it is is stigma. And to get a little professorial with this, I used to give a talk on the history of psychopathology. And people didn't know where mental illness came from. And people... Um, you know, that, that, you know, people thought it was, you know, witchcraft, you know, back in the 1700s and before that. And, and there's been evidence of this one thing called trephining, where people thought there were evil spirits in someone's head and, and they localized it, you know, to their head and they would bore a hole in their head to let the evil spirit out like if it was a physical thing. So there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, history and, and social constructs around the, the other uh, of people being different. And I think, you know, sometimes it, it, it scares folks. If uh, you and I have had conversations before, like where it's been, you know, if someone has, um, uh, you know, a, a, well, 
like, like let's say a, a non self induced cancer. Like if 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 someone has cancer and they've been a smoker for a million years and they have lung cancer, you know, there's that that's a gray area. But if someone you know has pancreatic cancer that has their lymphoma, you know, leukemia, whatever, there's not anything that I, that I know of that a person can do to cause that to happen to themselves. People have great sympathy for that. You know, people have a you know how can I help and what can I do, and people that. Uh, you know, some people want to keep their health care, you know, health sim- symptoms and issues private. But if someone comes out, you know, with that, um, they get a great outpouring of sympathy. If someone comes out with, um, hey, I'm depressed and suicidal, people start looking down at their shoes. I mean, it's it's rare that people would, you know, come out and, and you know, lead with that. But even if they did, it, it creates this discomfort for other people. And, and they think then this there's the, something wrong with that person. Um, is something that you know it's it's a flaw in their character it's a moral injury it's it's there's something wrong with that person that that if they were only smarter if they were only had more grit if they only you know did this that or the other then you know that would sort of magically not have them be anxious not have them be depressed not have them have you know thoughts about harming themselves and that's just you know it's a naive perspective that's not how that works that you know we we see people hugely successful people, you know, that, um, that have passed by virtue of, of suicides, suicide. you know, so, um, you know, and you know, just Google it. I mean, it, it'll be, you know, a number of, you know, name brands and people, you know, throughout, you know, decades that, uh, that that's happened to. So I think part of it is just this lack of acceptance. When people don't accept it, people then keep it to themselves. When people keep it to themselves, they don't seek treatment. And when people don't seek treatment, things get worse. And, you know, it just, Mm -hmm. it creates this very negative, you know, downward spiral. So I think the more that we can be accepting and accommodating and understanding of uh, of that, and again, I think it's a, a failure of empathy. I mean... Most things, I'm going to speak in very gross generalities, I'm probably going to upset any, you know, good psychologists and psychiatrists listening to this, but, but you know, a lot of what is in, you know, our, our diagnostic manual is called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's published by the American Psychiatric so- Association. It's kind of what we use to, to diagnose and therefore then subsequently create treatment plans for folks. And just about everything in there, um, you know, is a is a, a worsening of normal circumstances that people experience. So if you, most all of us feel anxious from time to time. Most all of us feel, you know, what we would call depressed or blue for, or sad from time to, time to time. You know, we lose a loved one, we feel grief. We have a trauma, you know, we have, there's PTSD. There's a variety of different kinds. That's an anxiety disorder. There's a variety of different kinds of PTSD. So, um or causes for it. So in, in, or, or eating disorders or anything, it's, it's okay to diet. It's not good to be anorexic. You know, it, it, there's all these things that oftentimes what winds up being a diagnosable, treatable disorder, if you will, is the amplification of a normal thing, part of living, part of life for everyone. So that makes it even harder for people to empathize, say, well, hey, I get depressed too. Well, hey, I get anxious too. You know, why is it such a big deal for you? And that does nothing other than alienate the person that that is you know sharing something very difficult perhaps for them to share and then just gives them the message the tacit message of you know hey I can't talk to you about this you know you you're not going to understand it you're going to try and help me by you know giving me advice or telling me to you know do this or that as opposed you know they're just sort of like quick fixes that that don't really fit for me because I've tried those years and years ago 50 times and they didn't work and you know I'm still dealing with this so I think a lot of it is mm-hmm. cultural social historical um, and all those again just add up to make it making it difficult for people to to share when they do have something that's serious and for people to be able to know how to to deal with it when it does come out does come up yeah no that's that's uh, that's a very very accurate depiction and it's funny when like i'm i was it's hard to to come up with questions because i'm literally and i told you this the first time we did the podcast i'm actually listening and sort of visualizing everything you're trying to uh, tell me which is often what makes for the best podcast. Yeah, I know that's but, what uh, makes you a great interviewer. Yeah. Interviewer, George. So <laughs> that's why I love it. Because I'm, I'm like I'm blanking out on like what the next question is because I'm so <laughs> I'm, I'm so I'm trying to be in the present of what you're saying. But um, the the one thing actually that does come to mind immediately um, is is every th- every fallacy that I've experienced myself, and also a lot of the you know the things that I I think that the past few years that I've personally learned a lot from, and mm-hmm. what the biggest benefit of living and uh, soon marrying a psychologist is honestly the, the lack of empathy 
I actually had previously, hmm. uh, to which was a surprise. I always thought as wow. a business person, as someone who was very uh, extroverted, you know, I love people. I derive a lot of energy from people. Um, I, I genuinely care about others. Uh, you know, I sympathize a lot. But my understanding of what empathy was and EQ was, was very wrong. Huh. And I'll, I'll give you an example. And I think a lot of people resonate with this. Uh -huh. When you were talking about that example, when someone comes to you with uh, any any challenge, right? Let's say they're very anxious. My first response used to be, first of all, is have a response, mm -hmm. which is wrong to begin with. Mm -hmm. Second of all, it was, hey, either, you know, it, was, it wouldn't be as as deliberate as saying like shrug it off, but basically, you know, see the positive, uh, you know, what are you grateful for? Um, like, it's okay, you'll, you'll get through this. You tried and to it, fix it. Ex exactly. Yeah. I had this like innate reaction and it came from a good place, but I didn't know how much harm I was causing by doing that, you know, genuinely. Sure, sure. I, I thought I was trying to help because in business also, when we, I think what we have is a lack of education in your domain. Mm -hmm. And so what we look for is solutions to a problem when you come to us. What I then had to learn to do was just create space for someone to come share what they're going through. And instead of victim blaming, shaming, instead of, you know, trying to say like, here's a quick fix, maybe just ask questions, not to, to, to show that I have an answer or creating a path, but just asking questions to genuinely help them clear the, the way towards a potential solution. Mm -hmm. I think that was a very, very uh, hard thing for me to do, to be honest. And I was surprised by how many people resonated with how I was. Yeah. You know, well, cut yourself a little slack. I mean, I think that is the, for certain areas, you know, certain professions or whatever that, that might be more of the, you know, the default response or just people perhaps in general. But I think, you know, for whatever reasons you still, and I wouldn't necessarily say it's all just because of, you know, your relationship with your fiance, but you're you're an open inquisitive kind of person and you like to see the nuance in things and you know I, I totally get what you're saying it's like in perhaps in business or in startups or or in leadership uh, or in consulting it's sort of like there's a problem got to fix it there's a problem got to fix it. Right. engineering you know but <clears throat> the in the context of <clears throat> maybe it's a difference <clears throat> pardon me between coaching and consulting or therapy and, and consulting that, you know, you, you do provide that space. And part of the, maybe the, 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 the meta aspect of it is that there's a, uh, an acceptance that gets communicated through that provision of space, you know, that helps uh, diminish any, perhaps I would hope, I would think feelings of judgment uh, from the other person's part. You know, the fact that, you know, George is listening to me, George is paying attention to me, George is showing me, you know, through through active listening and, and sincere questioning, non in a non judgmental kind of way, um, you know, to talk about this and that whole kind of process, you know, even if if you don't get to some kind of, you know, glorious, wonderful solution over the course of, you know, six months of talking about it periodically, you know, over a co over coffee, that um you know, that that person still feels, you know, that, that they can talk to you about these kinds of things. And, you know, sometimes issues are transient and, and, and can be dealt with in a variety of different kinds of lighter ways. Other things are more difficult or more chronic and, you know, might always kind of be with a person and just have to be worked on, worked with, you know, just like having, you know, any other kind of, uh, um, issue that's, that's chronic for them. They, you adapt around it and, you know, you have good days and bad days. It's sometimes scary, uh, and thank you for that, of course. Um, and, and, you know, I think what comes to mind, too, is, it, you know, it scares me to think how easy it is. And, and you actually put it in a way I've never heard it, where you were saying, basically, sometimes a lot of what you see become a severe, de a severe depression or anxiety results from a situation we all go through, but it becomes amplified. And I think that that thought by itself, the fact that that could happen to just anyone, and it's something that is very difficult to work on, you know, because yeah. not everyone, like as much as a therapist will work with you, it's something that you also have to work within yourself and really try to sort of deconstruct and, and, and build. What are some things that, that you've done, Chris, you know, having obviously experienced a very successful career, um, you know, on the personal life aspect, you know, you've had different situations. How have you basically maintained your mental sanity? 
Well, <clears throat> there might be some that would argue that <clears throat> I've done a very poor job of that. <clears throat> um, I, um, I have long dealt with uh, anxiety and depression. Um, when I was a little kid, my folks were, I don't know how much of this you'd necessarily remember or we even talked about, but um, my folks got divorced before I was one year old. So I pretty much was raised by my mom um, as a single parent. Um, it, when we lived with our grandmother, but, um, which was also kind of, you know, a, a surrogate parent too. But, um, I remember just as a, as a child every day before school, I would have a stomach ache and just be miserable and be, just have like, you know, a, a, be a bundle of nerves on the way to school. And my mom took me to the pediatrician and this is in the 1960s. And the, the treatment was, um, you know, being put on an anxiolytic uh, and probably back in the sixties is probably like a tranquilizer of some sort. So, you know, I'm this chubby little boy, you know, taking tranquilizers to be able to get to school. It's like, holy smokes, you know, what kind of, you know, future is that going to yield? So, um, <clears throat> And that, you know, and, and honestly, I don't know if the dose was wrong or I was just, you know, too young or what the heck was, you know, I, I didn't know my psychopharmacology very well, like at age eight, but, um, <laughs> it just, it made me loopy. You know, that's what I described to my mom. It's just like, you know, I'd walk, I, I have this weird memory of walking down a um, grocery aisle. We'd gone to the grocery and I'd, you know, taken this med whenever and just feeling dizzy, you know, feeling like, you know, the, the aisle was kind of tilting and stuff. So so she stopped the med, and that was kind of it for any kind of medications or anything. And the, um, you know, you just, I don't know, you know, not to give my whole freaking life story, but it's just, there's been a lot of hard times. There's been a lot, of, you know, it's it's nice for you to say, you know, it's it's nice to look back at all, you know, the, the you know, taking the victory laps and stuff, but it's also been punctuated with a variety of trying times. You know, I... I was divorced. Um, I, you know, like the, the single parent thing, I was, you know, morbidly obese as a child. I, you know, there's just been, you know, every, not every job I applied to did I get, you know, not every article that I wrote got published, et cetera. So there's been a lot of, you know, things that weren't particularly, you know, fun uh, in, during those times. But um, part of it, you know, I, I went to therapy. I've been to therapy a couple of times when things really got bad. Um, and you know, that helped. Um, it, and I think also, you know, a, a hugely critical thing, which is sort of hard to design, you know, the, a lot of these things are like, you know, just being, you know, rugged, ruggedly independent, so to speak, and seeking help when one needs help. But one of the other things that's just been super helpful for me throughout, you know, the last, you know, 37 almost years has been, uh, being married to my wife, um, and she's also a psychologist, so so way to go with your fiance. <laughs> I think that helps. Um, but you know, it, it's sort of like we, um, you know, and again, it's not always been you know roses and butterflies, you know, with any kind of relationship either. But um, you know, we kind of we we got get each other, we got each other, we, you know, way back when. Um, and it's sort of like we ebb and flow with each other in a in a way that, um, you know, when I need support or she needs support, we know the other person's there and, and is able to provide it. And, and, uh, it's not always necessarily, does she know what or how it is that I need that kind of support and vice versa. But we, you know, have this, this, um, grounding that allows us to be able to talk about those things and to kind of try and figure them out together or, and, and she challenges me too. I mean, which is also a good thing. You know, it's not all, you know, here's whatever you need, honey, kind of thing. I mean, mm -hmm. I, 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 I've joked publicly in a variety of places that I never have her read anything that I've written until it's published <laughs> because I can't, too late now. <laughs> yeah, I can't take, I can't take the criticism. So, so it's not like, you know, she just, you know, says all these nice, you know, soft ball kinds of things or whatever. So, so I think that's part of it. Whatever it is that makes for a good relationship with, with whoever your, your life partner winds up being, I think has been a, a real critical factor for me. And, you know, and she would come to therapy with me sometimes when, you know, there's things that needed to get talked about to, you know, have her learn some things about me, just like you might have a loved one, you know, go to the, your primary care physician with you when you've got some kind of 
problem so that they know how to manage your medication or they know what to do if, you know, some something happens. You know, I used to do that with my mom. Like if there was some kind of healthcare issue that I needed to be aware of to know that, oops, her meds are kind of off a little bit or oops, we need to, you know, come see the doctor if this happens. But if this other thing happens, that's okay. It's it's not anything to be alarmed about. So I think partnering and, and again, that partner, I, I guess I would go out on a limb and say it doesn't necessarily have to be a a romantic partnership. It can be, you know, a partner with whoever that, that other, that, or those others might be, I guess, just close, strong relationships to be able to, you know, um, you know, talk with whoever you need to talk, whatever about out with, um, to get that kind of support to just not, again, be that, that solo rugged individualist, the Marlboro man, you know, riding off into the sunset on his horse, you know, to be able to, um, to, to seek counsel and, and again, to, to, to get help when you need it from whoever is going to be the, the best person or resource to be able to do that. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a person of faith, maybe it's a therapist, maybe it's a coach, maybe it's a mentor, but, uh, to have that kind of person in your life to help to, 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 to anchor you. I think going through difficult situations can also, you know, help with, with building that muscle of resilience. Um, you know, I, I'm still trying to figure out like with, uh, what Nassim Tlaib talks about with being anti-fragile, cause that's different yeah. than being resilient. So I haven't quite cracked the code on that one yet. If you do let me know. <laughs> so I want to, I want to be more anti-fragile, but, uh, you know, and I guess a lot of it too, I, I should say is, um, you know, a stoic, uh, you know, thought and, and, and stoic philosophy of, uh, you know, you know, Hey, don't be so full of yourself, <laughs> you know, like, Hey, we're all here just for kind of a finite time. Let's kind of put this into perspective and everything that's, you know, it's, it's a little tempest in a teapot, or is it really, you know, a big thing that really does, you know, take some, you know, calling all cars and, you know, let's, let's uh, get the SWAT team out to help fix this kind of a problem and to not just, you know, have everything be a, a chicken little and the sky's falling. Yeah, it's, uh, man, there's, there's so much to unpack. I feel like, you know, with the whole Stoic philosophy as an example, I, I, I you know, I, I'm subscribed to Ryan Holiday's newsletter as well as his books. Yeah. And he talks a lot about memento mori and, you know, living yep. in the present, yeah. right? Yeah, um, <laughs> and you're just, no matter how good it is today, you can be dead tomorrow, <laughs> so. It's true, and, yeah. and actually, I watched the video of his yesterday, and he was like, even when it comes to like a sunset, you know, every time, you know, you, you observe a sunset or a sunrise, also, it's important to keep in mind, not just that that uh, your thoughts of gratitude, but also that's the last time you're going to see that specific sunset or sunrise, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes yeah. I think that that context is so important. And I, I also think it's important to have on a daily basis. That's why affirmations actually could work. But you have to almost do them on a consistent basis, because what ends up happening is I feel like, you know, life gets busy and you 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 all of a sudden slip back to that way of thinking yeah um yeah and sometimes i've been having these th these these, th these thoughts recently where you know I, th I think we make life sometimes unnecessarily more difficult than it should be <laughs> yeah because to, <laughs> to your point it's like we we also strive for the hill yeah i feel like as humans we kind of get bored like it's funny how everybody chases to be at the top of the hill yet there's only gratification in actually climbing the hill you're right yeah you it's... know and so you, you get to the peak and now all of a sudden you're looking for another mountain to climb and uh, people forget that it's the struggle in the middle that's the most gratifying, not yeah. when you're at the top. Yeah. You know, I tell, I think, you know, well said, I mean, it's like, you know, it really is, is that, that journey rather than necessarily the end point. And it's sort of like all the activities that happen during that journey, you know, it's like Don Quixote or something, you know, it's like all those kinds of things that lead, you know, up to whatever the quote unquote end is, because that's never really the end, you know, then it's just kind of on to something else, but to kind of take that minute and, and, and enjoy the moment of that process. I remember, I did a, a double marathon some years ago, and before I started off, you know, I told like a couple of days before it, I said to my wife, it's like, I, and I took a day off work to do it because I didn't want to do it on a weekend and just a variety of other kinds of things. I really had set the stage for it and just really wanted to, you know, not have a bunch of, you know, things worrying me, you know, worry loops or something in the background. And I said to her, I said, you know, and it, the, the goal to your point, why, the, why, what cued this up in my memory was uh, that... Um, I got, I, I forget, I'm probably not going to say it exactly. It wasn't that eloquent probably in the first place, but I said, I get to run all day today versus 
I have to run all day today because I have this goal of doing a double marathon, blah, 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 blah. And it was sort of like, that was really kind of my flaw. I honestly felt that. It wasn't, you know, baloney or anything. I honestly felt like, you know, today is the day that I get to run all day. I don't have to go to work. I don't have to, you know, write a paper. I don't have to teach class. I don't, you know, whatever it might be. And that, you know, I think that's kind of getting to the point of, of what, what you're saying. And I, I would offer, I don't know if this is good advice or not, but when you were saying that too, George, it made me think of um, kind of um, integrating or institutionalizing certain kinds of rituals into your day every day, um, whatever those kinds of things might be. You know, sometimes people do the, what is it called, like, you know, the morning notes and stuff if, if they're more creatives and, and writers and, right. you know, whatever it might be for whatever person's, you know, vibe thing ilk is but to to ritualize these kinds of things no matter if you're traveling no matter if it's you know just a typical tuesday morning or or evening or whatever but to have those be you know those moments where you can you know take a breath take a break be mindful about what your day is going to be or what your day has been and you know just to you know i don't know if that's necessarily stoic or anything else but just that that kind of thing i have tried to also in my my life change up here uh to do and and i i don't i can tell you i don't think it hurts um and i kind of look forward to it i i kind of do it in the context of it just got a little moleskin journal and i just write in it you know kind of whatever and and make some notes about things and you know, I may, you know, probably when it's full, I'll probably look at it once and recycle it. <laughs> you know, it's not, not some, you know, big memento or anything, you know, uh, you know, fantastic or anything, but it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, a grounding ritual for me. And I think those, that might help get to what you're talking about, like with uh, affirmations or, or those kinds of things, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, and part of the reason is I think sometimes we forget how awesome we are. You know, and, and it's it's this it's this, and I'm I'm being for Jesus, obviously, but it's it's like this philosophy of, um, and I use this actually this perspective a lot. To your point, one of them is I get to do this, not I have to do this, and that's a big luxury, man. Like to be yeah. able to, you know, parse out a full day to run a marathon, that is an actual luxury, and I think we have to keep that perspective in mind. Yeah. Um, another another one is whenever I I hear someone is is hard on themselves, I always say if 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 you were approached by a friend with exactly the same situation and struggle <laughs> that you're facing, what would the prescription be that you would give them? <laughs> you know, and they often look at me like, why would you even have, like, <laughs> stop being smart with me? You know what I mean? They kind of get pissed off that I even, like... That you like, have such a good point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, well, if you put it that way, then obviously I'd say, like, you know, don't over-exaggerate, you know, like, it's not that big of a deal. You're doing fine. You're in a good place. So it's, it's just funny sometimes how you... Oh, Yeah how you can minimize a problem. Yeah. Um, I, I did just want to touch on something. I, I think two more points, if you're okay and have. I'm good. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, two, two more big themes I want to touch on. You mentioned anxiety a lot, and that's something I'm starting to understand more of. Uh, and I think understand it a bit better. You know, I thought like whenever I'd feel anxiety, um, and for me, it was always, I think, performance mm -hmm. anxiety, mm -hmm. um, especially in business, whether it's around a presentation or oh, yeah. I, had, I had such a high standard for how it should be executed mm -hmm. that sometimes it becomes sort of playing in your head, right? Like, <laughs> oh, everyone's listening to me now. Like, what if I screw up this? And I think it's that is common. A lot of people face yeah. that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's also not this thing necessarily that you want to get rid of or can get rid of. So it's something that you have to almost learn to to work with. And I'm curious for you, uh, Chris, like what what was your strategy in terms of navigating, you know, performance anxiety, especially in your line of work? Well, I had, um, you know, in, in psychology, there's a lot of studies that have looked at anxiety and there's sort of like, you know, um, optimal anxiety. Like if if someone has a low level of anxiety, you know, they might just blow off any kind of preparation. You know, they, they slap together their PowerPoints, you know, 10 minutes before the show, you know, and then it, you know, it's awful because of that. And then other people do like what you said, you know, they trip over their own tongue and they, you know, break out in a cold sweat and, you know, it looks like a bad episode of The Office or something. So um, the, the, the important part is like, you know, the Goldilocks 
Goldilocks, the sweet spot in between. So there's an optimal level of, you know, ang performance anxiety, if we want to call it that just for shorthand, that gets you up and gets you into doing your present, you know, putting the PowerPoint together and reviewing the PowerPoint and practicing it, et cetera, and then feeling a certain level of confidence with it that, okay, I, you know, don't need to do that or do need to do this. So that's, that's generality. <clears throat> That's what research shows in, 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 in general. For me, <clears throat> I had a mentor early on in my, um, like, for kind of my internship uh, while I, for my doctorate that basically, you know, I, I was writing even back then and he, you know, and doing good stuff and he liked all that. And he said, that's really great, but you're too behind the scenes. You need to be more out front. And I was like, <gasps> you know, what do you mean more out front? And it was like, you know, he wanted me to like present on some of the stuff I was talking about. And it wasn't like a big whoop de doo And this is, this is so long ago, it predated, you know, PowerPoints and stuff, but it was just sort of like, you know, he wanted me to like kind of give a talk, give a lecture. And then I, I kind of, you know, it was short and it was specific to a thing that I knew a lot about. So that really helped. And, you know, it, it's, I, I would say for people for, so now I'll generalize to advice for maybe, you know, oftentimes advice, you know, doesn't fit for everybody, but here, here it goes for what helped me was, um, you know, unless you're like doing a speech class or something, you're doing something for school, but you know, whatever it is that you're talking about, chances are you're one of the experts and maybe a bit more so than most people in your audience. Now, this doesn't count for, you know, dissertation oral defenses or, you know, mm -hmm. other kinds of things, but in general, not, not with those exceptions taken in, uh, into consideration, that um, that gives you a certain level of confidence. And if you can kind of take that and to say, okay, I'm giving this talk, um, I, again, I'll just use myself as a hypothetical. Let's say I apply to um, uh, uh, do a, a talk at the American Psychological Association. Well, first of all, why would I do that? You know, if I didn't feel comfortable in doing that, then I'd be an idiot to apply to it. So first of all, there must be something already making me feel somewhat comfortable, if not excited, if not, this would be a neat experience. If not, I might learn something from this in, in my my topic as well as, you know, my approach to, to giving a talk. And I just would, um, you know, the, the goal in that is, is much different than someone saying, you know, you know, Hey George, you know, next week, give a talk on this topic that you know, 10% about, uh, to the board of directors, you know, that would be a terrifying, you know, kind of experience and people, I, I certainly understand and appreciate that that can happen. But I guess maybe to kind of suss this down is to, um, put together your materials, do your research, feel like you've done whatever it is that, you know, needs to get done, that you've done a full-throated um, approach to it, you have not left, you know, anything undone that's going to trip you up or, ha you know, have someone ask that one question that you really, you know, knew you should have looked at, but you, you didn't, and just to really feel, you know, prepared for it, you know, 110% prepared for it, about that you can answer just about any question that you can expect and maybe two or three others that you would never expect. And then if it's your PowerPoints, for me, you know, I'm always tweaking. Like, I, I, I use as much lead time in advance to kind of, you know, collect my slides, collect my images, et cetera, you know, tweak my words, et cetera, get all that down. And then I'll practice it and I'll practice it um, like with, for me, honestly, I, I'll like put, plug this mic in and put these headphones on and pull it up on a big screen as if I am actually doing a live presentation. And then I'll see, oh, that didn't work well, or oh, I've got too long of a pause, or oh, this slide really seems a lot like the slide, three more slides from here. And just really, you know, try and go through it and just really, you know, almost like how people practice for TED Talks and stuff that you just really, you don't practice it till you're, you know, dead in the ground with it, but that you just really feel like it's, you know, it's, it's conversational. And then I sleep on it and I, you know, I may think about it, you know, when I go for a run or I may think about it here and there, I may come up with a new idea because I just read a new article. I add maybe one more slide or I take one out because it's probably going to run too long. And then I feel comfortable with it. And that is the way that really binds my anxiety into feeling, going from nervous about it to enthusiastic about it to looking forward to doing it. Mm. Yeah. So I guess the, the key in there is, is preparation, even for those who, um, you know, feel like they can, you know, muster the, the actual execution of it pretty impulsively. Mm -hmm. But the more prepared you are, uh, and the reminder that, you know, you're, you're speaking to it for a reason. Right. I think one of the other things that helped me too is the notion that um, it, it's, it's what you're telling yourself you want to achieve from what you're speaking about. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an important sort of um, 
you know, dis distinguishing bec between performance and actual, you know, uh, projecting what, what it is that you want people to take away from it. Yeah. If you look at speakers like Elon Musk is, is a good example, you know, not the best presenter, but people listen for a reason. Right. Uh, and they're listening to what he has to say, not how he says it. Right. So and I'm, I'm not necessarily saying or suggesting that you should be a bad presenter by any means. Obviously, we all love storytellers and ones that are good at communicating. Um, but I think going from, you know, having the goal that this has to be the best, most perfect TEDx <laughs> presentation, you know, to what is my goal and moving away from it, having to be perfect versus ideal. And if I was in the audience, what do I want to take away from listening to me speak? Right. Yeah, I think and that that's a good point, George, like of having an appreciation for what is it that I'm giving the audience? You know, am I just up here, you know, to to, you know, be a peacock or am I up here to provide, you know, I hate people talking about, oh, you know, giving great value, but that kind of thing that there, there is some benefit, there are takeaways from whatever that is. And, you know, that could be investors, you know, saying, hey, this is a great company I want to invest or um, students saying, oh, that was fantastic. That was really interesting. I never really thought about it that way. So I think really having an appreciation, you know, for your audience, I think that's, that's a good point. And, you know, the same thing, to, you know, I know we keep talking about running, but, you know, if someone said to you, hey, George, I want you to go run a marathon tomorrow, you go, what? You know, it'd be awful. Or, or hey, George, I want you to run a marathon in, in a year from now, whatever it might be, doesn't matter a day or a year, that if that's an external kind of thing versus something that's something that you're motivated to do in the first place, you know, the outcomes and the approach to it are much different. The levels of anxiety and performance around it are, are going to be much different too. So I think maybe, you know, we might talk about this in the context of presentation, but is it it's something internally motivated to do or is it something externally required to do? And, you know, that makes it a little bit trickier in terms of, you know, best advice to be able to perform the best. But I think nevertheless, thinking about your audience and being well prepared, you know, suits everyone. Right. Um, I have one one last one for you, and uh, I guess it's more of a personal one, but I'm curious, um, in your opinion, what and how religion impacts our mental health? Uh, and, and I know it's a broad question, because re really, religion could be anything you, you believe in. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, when, when one says religion, you, you think of the Abrahamic religions like Christianity, Islam, and, and Judaism. But mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, do you think it, it has a positive impact on our mental health? And what's kind of your, your personal opinion on that? Oh, golly. <laughs> I, I know um, it's a heavy one. Yeah, it is. I, and I'm probably not a very good person to ask. I mean, I, I'll tell you my, you know, sort of, you know, goofy answer. But um, I, I honestly, I guess I'm kind of a work in progress with it. Um, you know, people in the audience may know that there's like, you know, a variety of there's pastoral counseling. So that is very much a, you know, faith based, uh, generally organized religion kind of circumstance. Some some pastors have additional maybe they might even have a you know PhD in psychology. So they might, you know, have a doctorate in divinity and a PhD in psychology and they do pastoral counseling. Um there uh, are others. There's, you know, like, uh, Christian and, and uh, other kinds of associations for, you know, people that kind of thread religion specifically to the issue of their therapy. Um, I think the difficulty can be that um, people need to feel, my bias, this is, you ask Chris, so Chris is going to tell you what Chris thinks, but um, my bias right. is that... Um, there has to be a very, it, it, it can be a very um, uh, gray line between, uh, you know, feeling, uh, have, feeling judged. You know, it gets back to our earlier point about stigma, you know, feeling judged mm -hmm. by someone. So there have been, these are bad examples, um, you know, there have been people, you know, saying that, uh, well, if you, you, if you prayed harder, it's just a variation on the theme, again, of what we talked about, of people just lacking empathy and thinking that, well, if you were, you know, as, as gritty as I was, you wouldn't be depressed every day. You know, well, if you were religious as I was, if you believed in, you know, fill in the blank as much as I do, then, you know, you wouldn't feel depressed all day. You know, if you only found, you know, whoever, you know, from, from Buddha to Jesus and everything else in between, then your life would, you know, turn around or whatever. You know, it's it's being evangelical or proselytizing, and oftentimes that comes across um, a little sideways to folks that are, you know, are in pain. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Faith and belief and spirituality and religion can be very helpful and very supportive to some people and can be very alienating and feel, you know, judgmental um, to other people. So, um, you know, there's, it's a, it's a really tricky, you know, and, and you get into all the different, you know, flavors of, of all the different, you know, uh, faiths and beliefs. And, um, it just really does, you know, kind of make it, make it tricky for people, um, in that, in that way. So I, I, th- I know that's probably not a real satisfying kind of answer, but, uh, I guess, you know, the, the, the classic, you know, as a psychologist likes to say, well, it depends, you know, it depends on, you know, how, how f- much faith is a part of a person's life or isn't. Uh, Mm -hmm. It depends upon how much, um, you know, uh, to me, I just circle back to if it's supportive and important and non-judgmental and empathically uh, a part of of someone's uh, being helpful to someone else, then wonderful. Um, If it tends not to do that, then it's probably going to be, you know, unsuccessful, if not, um, you know, negative or corrosive. Love that. Well, thank you. No, that's exactly kind of the the route I wanted to take. Um, Before we wrap this up, uh, Chris, what are some resources that you found helpful for folks in business who want to, you know, be more educated in the realm of psychology and mental health? What are some of those resources that you think are not too technical, but they're also helpful enough to either read up on or or watch or listen to? Oh, gosh. Um... I wish you would have told me this before. <laughs> it's sort of like one of those things. If I could grab my phone, I could tell you a bunch of the podcasts I listen to. I guess you know, there's um, there's a company in, based out of Chicago um, called RHR International, and they're um, organizational uh, psychologists um, and probably others, uh, MBAs, I'm sure, and whatnot. Um, and I think they have just recently started a uh, podcast uh, that's that's quite good. Um, and they, you know, they look at a, a variety of different kinds. It's they're so new. I'm presuming they're going to look at a variety of different kinds of issues. But um, that might be one spot that people might want to take a look at. I would also, I would also guess too, like depending upon what a person's, you know, itch is, uh, what podcast to be the good scratch might might vary because there's a lot out there on leadership. Um, there's, you know, again, a kind of, uh, a little bit more mental health is, you know, popping up in a variety of different kinds of, you know, other places and, and podcasts as well. But I would say, you know, someone specifically looking for something, um, you know, to deal with, you know, Hey, I'm a, a founder that's under stress or, Hey, I'm a, you know, a leader that's, you know, just, you know, been acquired or, you know, who knows what, you know, that there's probably, you know, some, something out there with a little bit of, you know, Google searching to find, I have, um, this is going to sound very corny maybe, but um, I have a specific board on Pinterest for uh, startups and leadership. So when I find some something, uh, they tend not to be podcasts, but they tend to be more so, you know, an article in Forbes or an article from Fast Company or mm-hmm. something that... Um, you know, someone that's a thought leader um, in that space that uh, that I respect, that I think is really kind of given a different kind of perspective. I love Seth Godin, for example. He's he's terrific, and, and so good. yeah, it tends to you know a lot of stuff with marketing, but I think a lot of his stuff is very generalizable to leadership. I think he also has you know he started his own kind of alt MBA. I think is actually what it's called. So. Um, those kinds of resources uh, are out there. Um, I try to, not in every episode, obviously, but you know, from my show, there's it's very magaziney. So I've had some folks on that uh, talk about valuation and, and startups, talk about leadership. Uh, again, the thread through a lot of my guests is in the humanitarian space, and that still also requires leadership um, in the nonprofit uh, kind of area. Um, we have on our on my nonprofit side, the Center for Global Initiatives.org, we have a tools page which has a number of um, uh, videos and lectures and books and articles that are all free, always, all the time uh, for people to take a look at if any of the audience is, is interested in the nonprofit um, uh, side of things. And it's in some sense, it's general nonprofit and, and gets specific in the sense of uh, 
uh, global mental health and, and global health kinds of issues, because that's kind of my specialty niche, I guess I would say. But overall, humanitarian intervention and, and nonprofit kinds of things. So um, I'm a big, as you as you know, you know, real into tools and real into resources, and and you know, if we can make them free or available to people, that's that's what we try to do as well. So, you know, any of the you know, googling my name and tools will probably you know provide folks with hopefully some good resources depending upon what their specific interest in in area is. Amazing. Well, uh, appreciate all all that you do, Chris. Um, you know, and, and as Chris mentioned, check out uh, a life in full dot org. You'll find Chris's podcast as well as a newsletter and anything you need to subscribe to by way of content. If you check him out on LinkedIn too, you can subscribe to his uh, newsletter called Tools for Change. Um, thanks. Th I mean, I, I don't know how many thanks I can I can offer in one <laughs> in, in one sentence. Oh, but, George. Uh, well, hey, you know, it, this is this is so mutual. I mean, you know, we were talking off mic before. I, I so look <laughs> forward to conversations with you. It's kind of fun, um, as Guy Spear talks about, you know, like learning in public, because uh, I feel like, you know, when you and I right. just kind of chew the fat, so to speak, about these kinds of things, I feel like I come away with just as much and, and probably a little more than what I'm able to provide. So, um, you know, you you walk the talk and you're you're very engaging with this. And I'm a big fan of your show and your work, too, man. Thank you, my friend. It means a lot coming from you. Um, I'm excited for this to come out. And this was a helpful conversation. A lot of these things that, as I mentioned, are things that are surfacing by way of thought and things that I'm personally uh, focused on working towards. So I'm sure this is going to be of value. Uh, kind of hit like an hour and 15, probably an hour <laughs> and a half. So that, that's how you know it was a good one. So thanks again, Chris. Awesome. Thank you, George. Take care, my friend. Cheers. Awesome.